now we uh, will see a contribution um, that is a case study. So as uh, Pavel mentioned uh, earlier today, a uh, bit of a different kind of contribution that uh, at some point got lost in the uh, ISS, but now it's it's back in form of case studies. Um, and here we will hear about a shape changing door um, to change the affordance um, to inform users about the current status of, of the room behind the door. Um, for that, we have from the University of Salzburg, uh, Eleni Ekonomidu, I, I hope that was correct um, and she will present uh, no door handle no entry expressing cues through a shape a shape changing door please share your screen and start whenever you're ready um thank you for the introduction so hopefully you can see my slides here Hello to you in Uds and to people watching this presentation online. I'm Eleni Konomidu from the University of Salzburg. Um, and today I will be presenting on behalf of my co-author and second supervisor, Bart Hengfeld. And I'm excited to present our case study on expressing cues through a shape changing door. Oops. There. So the main contribution of this work is the design and implementation of a shape changing door with dynamic affordances that communicates room availability. In addition to the design, we elaborate on empirical insights and implications of an in-theory implementation. So the motivation of this work is twofold. For one, we wanted to explore the design space where architecture and interaction design meet, especially when it comes to large human scale surfaces. Although there is a widespread adoption, examples of large surface interfaces are pre predominantly screen-based, focusing on augmented, mixed or virtual reality technologies. Other technologies such as shape-changing interfaces are rather underrepresented. For the second part, have you ever pushed a door that was meant to be pulled or kept pulling when it was supposed to be pushed? Donald Norman famously scrutinized the door placement, the poor placement and design of physical cues on these doors, which often misguide and deceive us. So what if these affordances, the strong cues signify how things operate were dynamic and thus adapted their shape based on space occupation conditions? The shape changing ex examples so far focus on door handle actuation, whereas large scale cases that investigate experience and people's reactions are rather limited. The initial step in our process was material ex exploration with flexible materials by pressing objects onto them. Then we performed an initial study using mockups of our concept. Based on the findings, we fine-tuned our design and implemented a high-fidelity prototype. And finally, we empirically investigated people's experience and reactions to the three scenarios our prototype enacted. So what we designed was uh, initially an experiential mock-up of our concept and collaborated with a professional dancer to fine-tune the movement of the shape-changing element of the door. The mock-up consisted of a freestanding door frame, which was covered in fle flexible textile. Together with the dancer, we agreed on a set of six behaviors that the dancer was uh, supposed to enact on the fabric using two probes that resemble door handles. These behaviors were split into two different states, inviting and uninviting, and three behavior motifs, seduction, nudging, and coercion. So these behaviors varied in style and tempo, intensity and speed, from teasing to slow localized motions and fast chaotic movements across the entire surface of the fabric. For the evaluation or to, to see what the user experience was, we invited 16 design students to observe and interact the other side of the door panel and express what they had experienced. 
From the findings, we deduced that the shape changing speed and form seemed to have a positive effect on the experience and that the students were able to distinguish from an invitation, a permission and a prohibition behavior. Therefore, we decided that the final prototype would enact three scenarios of use. In the first scenario, the door panel invites people to enter. In the second, it permits entry when the room is occupied, but still accessible. And in the third, it prohibits entry when the room is occupied. The scenarios were conveyed through kinetic movement, replicating the dancer's movements and suggesting that the door panel was demonstrating some sort of like lifelike behavior. The scenarios were matched to the cues where the door handle is in full view partially concealed and completely concealed. Here you can see the mechanism, which was integrated into the door panel, pushing forward a hybrid surface layer made out of flexible textile and wood veneer. A linear actuator attached to the back of the door would extend through an opening and push the layer around the door handle. A distance sensor attached to the door panel and an electronic circuit control the movement of the panel according to the three scenarios. For the implementation, we designed the flexible semi-solid surface structure based on a triangular pattern. And we laser cut this pattern on very thin plywood sheets, which we adhered on neoprene fabric. We removed the structure that held together the pattern, sanded the surface, and affixed the surface on the door panel. We then uh, oiled the final result. And this technique offers a low, a low cost alternative for rapid prototyping of high fidelity artifacts, as it requires less implementation time and number of actuators. Additionally, less uh, technical engagement is needed and it combines both the benefits of cloth and pin-based actuation. To evaluate our design, we conducted a final user study to investigate whether people would recognize the three communicate, communicated cues and their ascribed meaning, as well as the experience of interacting with an artifact. We placed uh, the artifact in a corridor at a student accommodation building and eight people experienced the three scenarios and described their experiences. In an exit interview, they also um, expressed their envisioned application areas. So from the findings, the entry invitation and the entry pro prohibition scenarios were correctly perceived. The door artifact uh, overall was uh, positively received, whereas participants suggested that our door could be applied in settings where safety or privacy is essential. We deduce that the cue is perceived the most when the kinetic movement of the door is more prominent rather than cues related to in-between states as in the case of scenario two. Affordances or signifiers are used to solve the door usability issue. With conventional signifiers, people still attempt to enter an occupied room even though it's occupied, maybe perhaps due to distrust or misinterpretation of the signifiers or simply because of momentum. We use dynamic affordances to provide real-time feedback regarding space occupancy and alter the actions that are possible. Taking it a step further on limitations, we eliminated the affordance of grasping the door handle altogether. And as one of our student participants supported, if there's no door handle, then there's no entry. So the elimination of this action possibly could be useful in cases where interruptions have to be kept to an absolute minimum. We have discussed the implications of our design if it were to be deployed in the wild for an extended amount of time through the lenses of safety and control, personalization and accessibility and social extension. When it comes to shape changing interfaces, control and safety are elements of concern. In the hypothetical scenario where shape-changing interfaces replace doors in our homes, a set of regulatory guidelines will need to be in place to handle situations of control in, in case of emergency and ownership over the infrastructure. In our scenarios, we set control to the occupant of the space and combated these safety hazards by using relatively soft and deformable materials and adjusting the actuation speed to the, according to the proximity. 
In terms of safety as researchers, we bear responsibility when it comes to preventing undesirable or damaging situations. Further research is required to establish common safety standards when it comes to designing shape-changing interfaces in general, even more so if they are to be integrated in buildings and thus in people homes. The customization of building elements showcases inhabitants' values and priorities to the outside world. Instead of different materials or colors, a shape-changing door could have customized shape-changing patterns. Customization could implicate accessibility through designs that physically adapt to different users. For example, um, the door could present the door handle adjusted to the height of the entity wishing to enter the room. For example, children or people in wheelchairs, pets or other beings. Other physical characteristics fitted to the user could target left-handedness or express the impairment. A shape-changing history feature, keeping track of these variations could be useful in case of a security breach or when a user is feeling nostalgic, for example, preserving the custom handle of a lost loved one. By basing the door's behavior on the status of the room behind it, the door becomes a social object instead of just a functional one. As such, the affordances are extended into the social domain. This shape-changing door can become a social extension of the room and not a conventional door. Its shape-changing behavior contributes to the social translucence by making social information available. Visibility, awareness, accountability, and identity could be aspects of such socio-technical socio systems. Naturally, um, a completely in the wild study in a public environment could yield more insights on people's experience and reactions. With our case study, we encourage researchers of the interactive search spaces community to engage in conversation around the concepts of large scale shape changing, changing interfaces, affordance elimination, and the use of shape change for social translucence. I'm now ready for your questions, which you can also pose via email, of course. So thank you for watching. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Um, seems like a quite a nice idea to finally keep my colleagues out when I'm in a meeting. Um, yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? So what I was asking myself is, um, I mean, the only the affordance effect I could also have when basically the door handle itself just vanishes. Um, but I mean, that might be a too weak uh, motion to, to be visible or to, to be even noticeable. Um, did you consider that? Like, what is the difference between basically a small door handle, just uh, like a round door handle disappearing or the uh, changing of the whole door? Um, I guess that if it's a larger surface and it, it extenuates the effect, but also our main aim was to see how an entire surface would change its shape rather than a localized shape change. Um, yeah, I guess that okay. answers your question. Yes, yes. I, yeah, I was thinking that it might also give more options to personalize uh, in, in some sense. Um, yeah, but I wasn't sure how, how far you have considered that. Uh, yes, there is a question. Uh, could you understand that or should I repeat the question? Uh, yeah, can you repeat that for me? Um, so the question was if there were other students um, that did not knew about the experiment um, and came by the door and how they reacted to, to that door. Yeah, so um, the first, um, the, the initial part of the, the study, 
um, happened when we invited people, but of course it attracted uh, interest as soon as there was movement in the door. Um, but of course we had a certain set of uh, participants, so we kept that to the, yeah, the, the set number. Um, but of course it created some form of interest uh, from other, uh, from passersby. Thank you. Um, yeah, there is another question. Yes. Um, thank you for that interesting presentation. Um, I was wondering, since like door handles uh, are sort of like a typical uh, example of industrial design or maybe architectural design in some cases, um, what challenges do you see when moving from sort of a um, when HCI designers would be then doing the dollar handles, like moving from architectural or industrial design into the world of like door handles, like for, for HCI designers. Mm. Uh, should I repeat again or? Yeah, why not? <laughs> um, so, so basically that uh, if you move from the architectural uh, side to door handles or to uh, to a more industrial uh, side of of the process. If I understood that correctly. Yeah. So, so the, um, when you design things in industrial design or uh, in architectural design is very different from something you might design in HCI. So, how do these two like different ways of designing differ? How you move between those? ways of design, but do you see any challenges there? Cool. <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, so, so I guess uh, standards are, would be different. Um, I mean, because the scale changes, so the standards would have to change anyway. For example, in our door, um, the actuation only works for that particular door handle. Um, but there are also like millions of other different door handles with other uh, properties. So the, the standard would, would need to change, I guess, of shape changing doors to accommodate all these different door handles. Um, and of course, there is different uh, from designing um, yeah, architecture than interaction design because the scale is different. Um, and then as, as you build larger HCI artifacts, what I've discovered is um, the challenges scale as well. So um, there are things that you have to pay attention to like um, gravity that you haven't thought of before or um, how the loads would work on, on the door that um, in normal conventional small artifacts you wouldn't need to think about. Um, yeah, I think that's how I would answer that. Uh, yes, one question. Right. Thank you for the talk. Um, yeah, I was thinking that sometimes I come by doors that have no door handles. Instead, they have a metal plate or something like that that indicate that I can push through this door. And I was thinking that if I was an undivided stupid user and I saw your door with this area, I might just push through the soft fabric and destroy your door. And so, so, so how would you indicate to a user that it's not pushable using shape changing interfaces? I guess the user has, has to know the three states of the door. <laughs> That's a limitation, of course, <laughs> um, of the design. So you need to know about the, the door. Yeah. yeah. So you need to know about the state of the door before you can, can use it. So 
is that what you're saying? You can't just place it in the public space where we can't expect people to have prior knowledge of the door or I mean I mean what I'm saying is there are certain conventions and I've learned the convention that I'm gonna see a door without a door handle, I can probably push through it. How do we go about teaching people that there are now new conventions? Do you understand the question? Yes. Mm. I guess the door could also be, I don't know, not, not pushable, you know? If you push it and, and then the, it's locked, then you cannot enter either way. Um, so I guess people could learn by trying. Um, and that's, that's how the knowledge for this door is distributed. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, um, we are at the end of the session. So one more round of applause for our speaker.